Welcome back. We're in the last few seconds before the PNWCC Jackpot 11. So this is the first time this event's being held on leechess.org. Um, in lieu of anybody else jumping up and saying they're going to commentate it, I'll give it a go. Um, and I'm excited because I haven't seen very many of Lee Kwong Liam's games. And I see that he's played enough games on the site that he's got the top rating in the tournament. Um, I looked up the tournament rules. It's only Lee Chess rated. It's not USCF rated or anything. This is played with the new Swiss beta tournament format that just rolled out on Lee Chess. So everybody's very excited about that. Um, yeah, so let's follow um, Liam's games here. Oh, I'm sorry. You are accustomed to 2D pieces. We will switch to the 2D set for everybody's convenience. I prefer the 3D pieces, but I will not, for today's uh, purposes, force that upon you. Okay. So here we have a Slav, a semi-Slav, Are we seeing e3 or bishop g5? e3 it is. I need to learn more about these lines because they do show up in my over the board play. So A4, I think, is a staple in this line somehow, but um, it's altogether possible in a blitz game. We could see some other direction. Also, maybe A4 is wrong here. Um, so here we have E5. I don't know about the timing of this move. Black does aim to play either E5 or C5 from that pawn structure. Um... Might as well develop all the pieces. It's the reason black aims to play e5 or c5 is so that they don't end up with isolated pawns, but they do give white some problems to worry about. Whereas if you were to push like your f pawn or your b pawn forward, you would end up with isolated and backward pawns. Now the c6 pawn is still backward, but um, that might not be too hard to remedy. So white has slightly more space and a slightly awkward bishop. So does that go back to d2 or what? So again, um, you have probably seen many tournaments on Lee Chess uh, before now. This tournament is using the Swiss pairing format, meaning that all players will be paired at the same time. There is an increment on the games, meaning that we can't know for certain how long the round times are going to be. Um, but probably almost all the games will finish in the same amount of time. There will probably be some games that finish much earlier. There will probably be some games that finish much later, but most games, on average, will take the average amount of time. Like, there will be this nice, probably a bell curve Gaussian distribution of uh, game times. And it might be a skewed curve. Um, so, eventually, probably White's going to play Rook AC1. Um, because the rook behind the a-pawn is not particularly useful here. Uh, and I say that because it looks like black has not ceded the a-file to white. Black's not played rook b8, so... Um, white is hesitating on pushing a4.
Yeah, with the Swiss format, you think Jiri would come out on top? He does play well, that's for sure. He plays solidly. Although his openings are uh, quite exciting. All right. Well, this is a blitz game. We see White's got this advanced isolated pawn on d5. Um, so, as with almost every chess position, we give White a slight advantage. That's how we evaluate it. It's not clear where the knight is supposed to go. Um, okay, so there a4 has happened because black is delayed playing rook b8 or rook a7 or anything like that. Um, now he has this tactical thing to worry about. And so that forces him to decide where he wants to move his pieces. He can't just shuffle all day. Um, so black gets ready to contest the A file. And white's on, under a minute. Black has successfully contested the A file, although white's other rook can swing over to A1 uh, on his next move. Uh, white lost a pawn. That's less than ideal. Um, I guess he's got some initiative for it. Or I just miscalculated and so did the international master. That's a hard tactic to spot. It's not typical to see a queen move to g6 like that. Uh, Usually you think about a kingside attack, you don't think about the fact that this also hits the pinned piece over here. So that's probably the end of this game. I mean, you might see rook e6 to try to hold it together, but um, I'm not sure that that's going to hold. Yeah, I don't know about this. Can I? Okay, yeah, I can clear arrows. Yep, that's the game. Uh, white has won the rook, so black concedes. So there are 23 games remaining. Here, Geary is winning his game. Here, uh, Logogieski. Uh, Seems to be defending. And yeah, it looks like Night King wins that game. As exciting as the attack is, it's petering out. Yep. All right. Um, Calevra's threatening to sacrifice uh, for the B pawn or the C pawn while also trying to conduct an attack. It seems that his pieces are a bit disconnected and White's pieces are a little better coordinated. So I'm thinking this might be drawn, but White has the better side of the draw, just given how dis uncoordinated Black's attack is. And the bishop on an open board is a nice thing to have. So absent any time situation, I think that White's going to take this. It won't be easy. It will require accurate play, but... Or rather, I think White has the better chances to take this, but also I think it's drawn. Okay. In time pressure, things have happened. Boy, have things happened. White has overpressed. And this is going to be very difficult to defend now. 
and this is Lost. So there's uh, five ongoing games. Uh, probably, yeah, there's the mate. So, okay. Now you have this uh, pawn end game here, White Winds. Tough break for Chest was 57. Um, oh wow, that's the way the pawns are moving here. Uh, yeah, the necessary sacrifice and promotion to follow. Wow. Oh dear. Yeah, that was an eventful game. I didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> All right, let's uh, continue watching Liam's games here. So I'm watching Liam Chess's TV. You can also see his TV if you navigate to his username or you search for the player name using the magnifying glass here. Uh, it's at the top of every web page. You can search for his username and then click the TV button. Um, So I'm intending to follow him until he gets a draw or a loss, and then we'll reconsider um, who our favorite is. Okay. So given the round time, I expected the TV to refresh any second now. There it is. So here we have him versus uh, Grandmaster Gordima. Gordima? And we have a Nimzo Indian defense. Queen c2, it's the line I play, although I don't know it anywhere near as well as these uh, grandmasters do. Okay, white forces an exchange. So white has basically given up the tempo advantage that they start the game with in order to get a familiar position. This might be difficult for uh, our favorite to win with the black pieces, just given white's opening choice. So black could further liquidate with like queen d5, I think, but that heads toward a draw. Um, there's a lot of candidate moves here. Now we see something like queen c8, right? Or do we throw in h6 now? We don't want to play h6 if we don't have to. But also playing it forces white to make a decision. But white's decision might just be to put the bishop on f4. And if so, then he'd be attacking the c-pawn. Yeah, so it's going to take a while for black to develop here. Or he could immediately liquidate. Um, taking on d4 might cause white to do knight takes d4. And then you have a symmetrical pawn structure and not particularly much excitement. Um, so I'm hoping something more exciting happens. Uh, if white takes on c5 eventually, black could play knight takes c5, and we could get some interesting attack going. Uh, or we could just do knight takes c5 ourselves. Um, I'm sorry, or uh, I guess there are other things we could do to try to imbalance the position. But my main point is that um, if white trades pawns, black gets another tempo. And if you give black enough tempi, he might actually generate a threat. So yeah, now black's threatening b5 and c4. Even though that we don't want to play that, um, it would uh, cause it would be an imbalance. It would give us something we could try to play for in the future. 
Um, if all the pawns are symmetrical, it's much harder to attack. White decides to trade off their bishop because it's on the same color square as their pawns. And so, like, there weren't very many targets for it, and it was impeded by friendly pieces. And we peter out to a draw. Yeah, in that early opening position, a5 threatening um, bishop a6 looked interesting. I probably would have just played bishop a6 outright, but it's, most of my moves are not that uh, theoretically sound. Yep, so now rook fc1. Nope. It plays another defensive move. Now rook fc1. I can't see us giving up the c file. Oh, but rook fc1 would actually lose material, wouldn't it? So yeah, this trade is forced, and white's on the defensive. Uh, black's threatening things like rook c2 and rook c3 here. Um... Okay, this threatens a queen trade that would just kill black's attack. Black allows it. Yeah, chess is hard. I don't know how these people learn to play it. Like, they have to practice all day. Just... And this here tournament does have a nice prize fund if anybody goes 11 and 0, which seems extremely unlikely, um, but theoretically could happen. But also, there's a decent prize on the line for the winner anyway. So they train and train and train and train for a chance at a prize. But more realistically, just having a reputation allows them to um, endorse materials and write books and things like that. So there are other benefits to having a chess reputation. Alright, so King D7. Nope, we're just going to trade the rooks. And white obliges. So this means our Grandmasters either are exactly on the same page about where this is going, or they have very different opinions about um, the evaluation of this. And the way I know that is because both players did that trade fairly quickly. So either they both agree that this is drawn, or... Um, white thinks that it's drawn and black is convinced it isn't black didn't spend much time evaluating oh well yeah if you want to learn to play chess so that you could play at this level you might need a time machine i don't know how else to put that Like, it takes a lot of time and effort. And usually the top players uh, had the free time during their childhood and the assistance of their families and neighbors and friends and everyone to help them become successful at this. Um, you might need a time machine to have that kind of experience. Yeah, so if winning prizes is your motivation, um, I'm just saying that might be difficult. <laughs> so yeah, our grandmasters disagreed over whether or not Black could win this. Um, he might be trying to win on time. Okay. 
Because, yeah, a lot of crazy things can happen in time pressure. We'll see if a two-second increment is enough to hold against a Grandmaster. Uh, we will see. Even if you are a Grandmaster, it's still really hard. Um... We're in for an adventure, folks. Because theoretically, a bishop is better than a knight. So now, black has got white's king corralled. Um, and now we've boxed the knight in as best as we can. And now black's king can threaten to go to the other wing. Um, white has to play... Or, yeah, white has to play an immaculate defense to be able to hold up Black's attack. There goes the A-pawn, but also maybe the G-pawn. So yeah, now he calculates. Um, I think White has held this. Knight D2 is an extremely gutsy move. Um... And unless you're playing that sort of move, you can't get into time pressure and expect to hold it. And by it, I mean, oh, save a draw. All right, knight h6. No! This might be okay, but knight h6 allows you to just snipe the pawn immediately. Unless, of course, um, that endgame is drawn. Or, I'm sorry, unless, of course, that endgame is lost for white, in which case you can't do that. There are a lot of split-second decisions to make here. Okay, king e5 is a waiting move. Because black's trying to figure out the right move here. And now black's king gets the a-pawn. But black could have done this more directly. Both players made a few inaccuracies that slightly impaired their chances. Uh, I don't know how I feel about knight e3. No, I'm sorry, knight e3 is good. It threatens knight c2. So white's going to continue threatening to try to get his king and knight to blockade on either of the dark squares in front of the black pawn. All right, now we see a trade. We don't see a trade. And black doesn't stop knight c2. I don't understand this game anymore. There we go. That was exciting. Hey. It's never too late to start a ballet. Although I don't know why you would. It's never too late. I'm not saying I'm going to go start doing ballet right now, but uh, just saying it's never too late for ballet. And this should be a draw. We'll see if black can hold it. Yep, there we go. Okay, well. Um, that draw affects our standings. So Penguin GAM is uh, doing his thing. Uh, he's well recognized in here. Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to pick who I watch next. Um, yeah, I have not seen much of Ninja's 64's games, so let's take a look. Also, update the stream title. Um, there we go. The truth hurts. Now, it's possible he still might win it, but, um, that's not what we're watching for anymore. All right. Wow. Go figure the two players whose names I called out got paired against each other. 
I should avoid doing that in the future. All right, so here we have Vant Kruge's opening, transposing to an English. Transposing to a reversed something, because I don't call this an English. I've played in English before. This doesn't look like an English to me. But technically it's still in English. I've played this, posi uh, this position before. At least this tabia with the white pieces. Well, unfortunately, since I don't speak Arabic, I'm going to have to mute the spectator room. Because I don't know what that says. Now, I see a phone icon next to the notes button. You think if I hit that, I would get to talk with these players? Uh, wouldn't that be fun? Alright, so white's threatening c5, black's going to play c5. Black doesn't play c5. Gosh. Well, that shows what I know. Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of this anymore. It looks like black's playing a stone wall, and white's playing something that's not quite a collie. And so we have this melancholy position. It looks like black's position's more flexible than white's. Black can choose... To... oh! I did not see that. And Penguin ain't moving. The fact that, like, both I missed that and Black is now spending more time does not bode well for Black here. But more concretely, this actually does look like a good move. Because after pawn takes c6, that's a fork, but then the b pawn is still hanging afterward. Black still has attacks on the king's side, but black's attacking potential on the queen's side is gone. So he could either take the knight and lose... Uh, I'm not sure how the material will get traded after that, but his mobility gets severely impaired. Or he can just admit that white has just won a pawn in clear daylight and try to come up with something and pretend like that never happened. And yeah, that's the wiser course of action for now. But knight d6 is concerning. Oh, I'm sorry, knight d6 would lose a pawn. If the knight weren't on e4 defending d6, then knight d6 would be worth considering here. But yeah, white's just won a pawn, white's got something of an advantage. It might be enough to win. We'll see. Yeah, you gotta root for Tang. I gotta say, I've gotta root for the player who's higher rated. Because I'm doing the broadcast and trying to have a consistent story to tell. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, apparently Penguin's got an incredible bullet rating. We'll see if um, that helps him in Blitz Chess. Although, honestly, if you have the black pieces and you're down a pawn against a Grandmaster, it's pretty hard. So the threat is G5. And black wants to just attack and white needs to come up with something but white um, once they figure out how they're developing their pieces uh, will consider if they're playing f3 or b5 to bust up the attack um, and start their own attack I'm not sure that that's a great square for the knight but chances have to be taken. Uh, 
I don't understand at all what's going on. Um, there's a lot of tactics in the air. Note if white did knight takes knight, black's bishop on b8 comes to life. Now it's true that the knight would immediately cover this, but also the pawn just takes the knight. So, yeah, knight takes knight would be um, committal. This is a more flexible move. And black runs away. So I guess black agrees with white's analysis, and now white starts their attack. Um, eventually white would like to get their knight to uh, d6 or e6 or one of the sixes. They'd like to get this knight off the rim. So are we going to see bishop d4? We do. So white's held steady and threatens to either push or take. And black has to go mate white before white promotes. All right, we're going to maybe see the knight trade for the bishop. If black does trade off their knight, uh, their attack slows down quite a bit. Um, now granted, if they take on b5, and then knight takes the bishop a6, um, that might trade off into an endgame pretty quickly. White's still bearing this c5, c6 threat in mind, so that taking the b-pawn ain't free. White's knight is still on a3, still waiting to get into the game, so white has to make a choice between do I push the b-pawn, do I take on c6, or do I find some other way to make progress? Okay, black has trapped their queen. Hopefully it won't be fatal. Black has untrapped their queen and continues exposing their king. White's preparing rook g2. And I think, oh, wow, I expected a repetition there. Like why? I guess black is playing for the prize. They want to try to win all 11 games, so you have to take some risks to do that. Queen g3 is the threat, followed by queen h3. It looks like white is overpressed. Yeah, um, yeah, so there's queen g3, queen h, oh, I was going to say queen h3 and then queen f1. But that doesn't apply here because the the queen's still on d3, it's not on h2. I was imagining this queen had moved over here. So in that case, like you'd see this sort of thing happen. And the queen have to block, but instead this is just made on the move. So well played Tang. Yeah, uh, apparently playing a lot of bullet can uh, help you play ch uh, blitz better. So we got to pick a new favorite. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not time for that yet. We still have other games in progress. This is actually exciting. I like that the games don't end all at the same time because it gives us games to look at. Um, now granted, the last game of the round is unfortunate, but until then you have interesting stuff going on. I assume draw agreed there. I don't know. Um... Uh, no trade. Black does need to get their king out uh, to win this. Or not. <laughs> White blunders the b-pawn. And the a-pawn. And their king's still in the middle of the board. So White's got something in mind that's akin to the knuckle puck if you've ever seen the mighty ducks like there's some moves that only work in very specific positions so yeah it's knuckle puck time um 
Yep, there it is. All right, black takes it. Um, and theoretically, this is drawn. We'll see if white knows the theory. I'm not saying that to be sarcastic. It's actually not easy in a blitz time control to hold this. You can either know it or not know it. That's um, how this endgame goes. So black putting their rook on the third rank does complicate the uh, make this defense as challenging as possible. And black's probably going to put the rook back on the third rank. Nope. Nope, we're going to see the third rank defense, and that's a draw, I think. I don't remember. No, I'm mistaken. I'm very mistaken. Yeah, like I said, you either know it or you don't, and it's not easy to hold. To hold this, white needs the rook on the wall, uh, where black's rook is. So, there can be attempts to hold this here, but I don't think it works. Right, so white's king gets displaced. And there we go. And now we're going to see Lucena in a position. Or... We're going to have something easier. Uh, C8 queen also works there. You could invert the move order, I think. Because your king and rook are on the same file. You could have promoted, and then rook takes, and then check to win the rook. But, uh, yeah, this... Yep, that's a classic. All right, we got to pick a new favorite. We have five players with three points. Let's pick the one who's got the highest rating. So, Keyborg, you're up. Don't let us down. So this is what their last game looked like. I hope you watched that all. Hope you were watching carefully. <laughs> oh, uh, this is the position that I... Claimed that I thought they agreed to a draw or something, but no, now I can see how many pawns there are on the board. Yeah, this does favor white. All right. Here, Tang's got the white pieces. Let's see how he does it. Black is equalized. But I guess that's fine. Tang is really good at the rest of the game, so... He'll make up for his opening deficit somehow. Now, the fact that like Black's got equal chances here doesn't mean that it's a dead-drawn position. It just means that whatever advantage was offered by moving first is lost. So, there's the check, and then we take the knight. Yeah, the first move advantage does exist, but it takes work to keep it. Alright, so castle, right? There, we continue development. I didn't expect this offer of a trade. White does not need to immediately cash in on the offer because the bishop can't go anywhere. I expected bishop d7, but maybe that loses a pawn or something. Um, so yeah, instead we see this, and... Yeah, I don't think bishop e6 was the best use of the tempo. So, I guess where that leaves us... Is that we're uh, white is slightly better again. Black's center is slightly overextended. Both players' developments are good. 
Um, if I said white center is overextended, I meant black's center is overextended. Um, it's not, oh, I was going to say it's not easy to confront uh, black's center. We'll have to choose if we play e3 before we play f3 or after. Um, apparently you want to play it before because that's what our boy uh, Andrew Pang or Tang is doing. Sorry, I had read an academic or I had read a paper by uh, Fide Master Peng the other day. Yeah, this is uh, Tang, who's playing white. I guess for a blitz time control, e3 makes sense. Normally I would spend a long time stressing over what's the right way to advance here. Honestly, with black advancing on the king side, it probably makes sense for white to advance on the queen side instead of pushing e3 or f3. Um, but for blitz, it makes sense to get positions where it's not easy to accidentally hang your pieces. Meanwhile, black is concocting some kind of attack. <laughs> Ah, uh, Zug Addict has also gone live. Fide Top 10 in the world of Humboldt County is also playing on Lee Chess. Uh, I wonder if he could be persuaded to do analyses for the, this kind of event. So this is the 11th um, such tournament in this series. I don't know anything about the previous tournaments. I looked up the conditions of this one. And unless you have an international master title or better, it you have to pay an entry fee um, and there are prize payouts too but yeah kudos to Zug for going live that'll be plenty entertaining for everybody to watch For some reason, Chatty doubly announced. Uh, maybe it's an error on Twitch's end. I get these pop-up announcements when people go live or change their stream status. I think Chatty's sending me double notifications for everything. So. Yeah, this is a position with pieces on squares. Um, no, but white's actually got a commanding hold on the C file, which will result in their um, probably winning the B pawn. And black's kingside attack is much slower than I anticipated. So we could see rook d6 here. It makes me nervous. But also losing the b-pawn makes me nervous. The reason I'm nervous about this is because of rook c8. And uh, white takes the back rank. You can actually fight over squares, not just pieces and pawns. So controlling your opponent's back rank is usually a comfortable thing for you. White debates whether to do that or something else. Um, it's possible a rook trade might even further benefit white. Because uh, their bishop and most of the pawns uh, coordinate well. But I don't think it's enough to win. Also, I think that if black thought that rook d6 were losing, he probably wouldn't have offered the rook trade. Um... Like, so, I, I'm thinking white's probably not going to actually do that exchange right now. Our grandmasters have a disagreement, and it's okay. They're both grandmasters. They can work these things out.
so White's saying that White's best chances lay with the move they picked, and Black is asserting that their best chances are with the moves they pick. And that sounds really obvious, and it is, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think of how, what to counter that with. Like, if I saw something convincingly proving that one player was winning here, I would at least say something. It's not that obvious that an amateur like myself can notice this. And I don't think that either player knows that there's a decisive advantage for anyone yet. So I assume King G2 happens next, both to avoid a first rank check and to avoid some sort of Knight F3 or Knight H3 check. There it is. Don't know why that took so long. Um, because, yeah, it's hard to check the king in this position. We're probably going to see a perpetual somehow. Okay, white traps their bishop. And finds a different way to get the bishop developed making an immediate threat in exchange for making their position kind of loose. There's a queen trade offer. Um, oh, well, I'm... I was going to say that this looks very drawn to me, but what do I know? I mean, yes, white is up a pawn, Yes, this is challenging, but also I don't think that white can assert an advantage here. G5. There it is. So, yeah, black's pawns are mostly on dark squares, um, which are difficult for the bishop to attack. Black has a solid grasp on the center for now. Um, so the bishop's going to have to be defending against threats from the knight. And I don't mean the knight harassing the bishop, I just mean, like, the knight wants to win the pawns. So both the king's side and queen's side pawns are threatened. Oh, also, black has a fortress. So, yeah, white's not going to be able to break this fortress, just given how a bishop moves. They'd have to trap the knight. The knight's a scary piece. Um, this is something that uh, Tang knows well, <laughs> that you can pull off a lot of shenanigans with a knight. It's, uh, people just aren't good at predicting how it moves. See, so, yeah, a white commits to keeping their bishop on active squares. Black does not want to move their king, because moving the king is risky, and there's the draw. All right, let's go back. Two games remain, white wins this. Now to win this, white might have to jettison the front pawn. But now this theoretically, I believe, is a win. I think I've seen this in a book before. It surprised me that it was a win, but... Um, it's also important that white not accidentally self-mate. This is an amusing position. Let's bring it up on the big board. All right, so yeah, this is getting close to the position where you jettison the pawn. A lot of things can happen in time pressure. Right, Black's trying to get a stalemate. Uh, Black's found a perpetual. It could have been all cute and played Rook A3 check. Like Rook A3 threatens a stalemate. Um, 
See, I think White's admitting that they don't know this one. That's unfortunate. <laughs> this is a hard one. Um, but I think they've at some point misplayed it here. So kudos to uh, International Master up to something for holding against a Grandmaster. We might see a situation here where white offers the pawn. Oh, never mind. I was going to say white offers it and then black declines to take it on account of the 50 move rule. Uh, I don't know if players uh, at the top level keep track of move counts since the last pawn move or capture. Yeah, that's a tricky rook end game. There's a lot of things you can get wrong there. So we are going into round five. Um, yeah, this is a long event. It's nowhere near the length of a marathon, but... All right, I guess we're going to follow Mr. Martinez here. See how he plays uh, his game. All right, watch carefully. There you go. That's how he plays. Ah, <sighs> so. All right. So we see Keyboard playing. I'm forgetting the name of the Bishop B5 Sicilian. I mean, that is one name of it, but there is another name for it. Um, and that's one of the easier ones to learn and play accurately. It has the disadvantage of giving away the bishop pair. Uh, evidently, black has played a early rook c8, which I guess could target the c-pawn. And white's just trying to liquidate. So we'll see. Um, okay. See a lot more liquidating of pieces here. Black has a weakened D pawn. White has a weakened doubled F pawn. I'm guessing we're going to see a rook endgame. Yeah, I would not have guessed King D7. Not from a Grandmaster. But this is Blitz, so anything can happen. I guess it's worthy of note that Knight B5 is not possible here. So this is out because um, the pawn guards that square. So, yeah, targeting the d6 pawn is actually kind of challenging. I guess that's why black felt that this might be okay. So black might intend h6 and g5, and then find a way to activate their bishop and their rook. White needs a plan. And I'm not seeing a plan for white. There are a lot of things white could do. I guess that's why I'm not seeing like what an actual plan would be. A plan where you coordinate your pieces to achieve some tangible end. Like... I want to play knight e4, but also recognize that's a knight trade and probably liquidates into a draw. Um, but also I don't know what else white would play here. 
pushing the queen side looks challenging because black has the c-file already. White's already taken the g-file. White could express interest in taking the e-file and just say I'm not going to attack the d-pawn. I read I'd prefer to have squares for my rook. Oh, here's an idea. So white lifts the rook, intending to transfer it. I'm not sure where. Um, but by moving the knight and the rook around, they can access more squares than they could previously. So if white's knight moves, black can just play knight d5. Um, so white might, yeah, white opts to move the bishop instead, even though now on g3 the bishop blocks the g1 rook. And black has safely made it out of the opening. Granted, black's pawn's still on d6. That's not where he wants it. Um, he'd rather have the pawn on d7 or d5. Um, okay, I saw that move was legal. I didn't say anything about it because I'm not sure where the knight goes next. This looks very confusing to me. We might see rook e1 or rook d1 here. Really, either rook to d1 makes sense. Um, huh, or we have door number three. We're going to force the rook to move off of d5. Uh, but we could have just played c4 directly. There wasn't a need for this b3 to proceed it. Maybe there was a tactical problem with immediately playing c4. Um, Alright, black has activated their rook. And white's got to find a way to do the same. To the player's credit, neither one of them is trying to trade off everything. So they're trying to make this interesting for themselves and for us. So white has three pawn islands, black has three pawn islands. Um, black's pawn is on d6. White's pawns are in f2 and h2. So it's not really clear that either player stands better here. So I'm guessing we'll get there. There's knight e8. And then bishop f6 is probably coming sometime in the future. Maybe not right now, but it's intended. Uh, there's a nice rook c2 fork tactic, so this allows black to exchange um, or open white's king some other way. Yep, black continues trying to open the position. As soon as white gets out of the pin, they can consider moving the knight. And knights are spooky pieces. Knights are very spooky pieces. <laughs> Alright, materials even yet again. And yeah, we'll see if the knight is spooky enough. It's threatening knight c5. Alright, knight c5 is off the table. Okay. We're going to need some magic to pull this one off. Finally, black decides to advance their pawns. Um, 
but it might not be enough. It's f5 check. If you don't play f5 check, black's going to play f5. Um, yeah, this is kind of a weird position. There are pawns on both wings. The draw is agreed. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I think white has slightly better chances in the position, but the time situation is in black's favor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the tournament. 15 games remain. This one's probably going to be draw. Okay, black, for some reason, if I saw that correctly, he's avoiding a queen trade. Maybe I didn't. All right, um, white advances their majority as they should. Black keeps their bishop on the opponent's side of the board as they should, because the bishop is more effective when it can't be attacked by pawns. See, so yeah, a d4 is probably the best square for the bishop. And now black has to hold. And white gets to try all sorts of nonsense here. I guess we'll put this up on the big screen because the players disagree about how this is going to play out. Um, yeah, indirect defense is really hard. Black continues playing on instead of repeating. A bold, bold decision. That makes me wonder, what is Black's title? You don't have to declare who you are to play on Lee Chess. You can play anonymously. It takes balls to decline a repetition against a Grandmaster when you're in time pressure. So... I'm curious, especially because you're down a pawn and you don't have a way to attack the base of the pawn chain. So really, black can't hope to win this unless white makes a really terrible mistake. And terrible mistakes do happen, but I wouldn't bet my game on it. At least I say that I wouldn't. If you look at my record, it's kind of different. Yeah, so declining the repetition might not have been Black's best move. But it did give us a more interesting game. So the question is, um, can White balance both defense and attack and not get mated on G1 and H1? Ah, that's the question. Here we have another repetition. No, we don't, because queen g2 would cover h1. Just kidding. Queen h1 still might have been best. With white's queen on h2, it's hard for them to take the pawn in h5. So now we have whatever this is. Yep, okay. Tough break. But there is a prize for somebody who gets a perfect record, which it does not look like is going to happen today, because um, everybody's drawn at least one game, or lost at least one game. So there goes the perfect record prize. Um, so in keeping with the theme of what we're doing today, I'm actually curious. So these are ranked by tiebreak. So Wizard98 has the better tiebreak, so I guess we'll follow him, even though um, he does not have the highest rating. He's got the best performance so far.
Yeah, isn't it amazing how resourceful these masters are toward the end of a game? Like, they find these mate threats out of nowhere. And then they defend against them, also, in difficult-to-predict ways. Okay, um, so this is an English or reverse Sicilian, um, and I think we've wandered into Skaveningen territory, although uh, black is being kettled here, so not totally sure whether we call this an English or reverse Sicilian. Black tries to figure out the best use of their extra tempo. Um, gives white this kind of interesting pawn structure with a potential target on a3. a3 does not look like the easiest target to hit. I would suggest that c3 might be a target, but it's also very difficult for black to access. So black's probably going to realize that uh, a future pawn to e4 is not in their plans. Yeah, so they actually provoke white to play e4 and undermine their own center. If e4 didn't happen, maybe black would have traded pawns and somehow made use of the light squares with their bishop. Instead, Black's bishop doesn't have very many squares to go to, and White could either trade or try to fence off the bishop with f3. Sorry, I thought it was White's turn there. My mistake. Yep, so Black's knight comfortably occupies the d6 square as white drums up a kingside attack. So when's f4 going to happen? We all know it's eventually in the cards. It's just a question. Oh, there it is. It's a question of timing. Like, does white want to defend more things? Try to activate the rooks to better squares first? I didn't think they'd want to tuck their king away to spend a tempo on that. Um, all right. Now rook f1. I say that with so much confidence because, like, um, the rook either eventually goes to f1 or to b1, but with black's knight currently on c8, uh, the rook to b1 doesn't look so appealing. Yeah, I guess white delays. Um, they consider where to put their queen and bishop first. The bishop on e2 has nowhere better to go, but the bishop on b2 might have plans for some other square. So black finally moves the knight. And having moved to the knight, then uh, b6 becomes a little bit of a target. Okay, white jumps right into the middle of this tactic. And we're suddenly in an endgame. I hope you calculated this endgame, because I sure didn't. 
So if black plays rook takes c6 eventually, that would defend the b6 square. Um, white's bishop is blockaded by their own pawns, so they'll probably be thinking about e5 and bishop f3. And trying to keep some semblance of a dream alive here. Um, or the players might just agree to a draw. I don't know. It's not like we have Sophia rules or anything. Okay, well, this is not the world's easiest rook endgame. It would be better for white if they had one extra tempo with their king and a slightly better square. Um, but it's not clear how black's going to develop their king. They need... Black would like to have their king on e6 already. White would like to have their king on e3 already. Um... In general, it's good to have your king in the center because that gives you many options as to what you attack next with it. Right, white settles on this more cautious king f3 thing. I guess because defending the g2 pawn is a bit of a priority. Uh, black does this before, white has a chance to play g3. And yeah, the rooks are off to the races. Black spots the c pawn is actually more valuable than the h pawn. And it's gonna be tricky. Um, if white's king gets to the center, that's bad news for black. But also, black needs to liquidate more pawns somehow. Oh, yeah, I guess that helps too. That if a pawn race does occur, black's pawn would be on a4, one square closer to promotion than a turn ago. Curiously, I don't think either player wants to move their rook off the 4th or 6th rank, respectively. Um, just, like, allowing your opponent's king to become active is too much of a cost. Let's see how black has to repeat this way, and white will oblige. And that's the game. Alright, we got another rook end game. This will be amazing if black manages to win this. They have many tempi, or many moves anyway, um, to get some sort of imbalance, but white has set up a fortress. So black needs a very clever tactic to outsmart his international master opponent. A lot of things can happen in time pressure, and white's managing their clock well. Black's being careful to avoid a threefold. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, threefold. And black's also observing the 50 move rule. This might actually push leech us to its limits. And by that, I mean the 300 move rule, um, whereby if the game hasn't concluded in 300 moves, uh, Lee Chess adjudicates it. Historically, that hasn't been a problem. 
usually one player or the other messes up before the 300th move. All right, 10 minute countdown till takeoff. Um, is it still raining down there? Because like, the fact that it rained earlier today should still strongly discourage a launch. Just having that kind of weather on your craft right before it takes off is concerning. But we'll take a look. Um, NASA launch. See how it's going. There's all this talk about how they're gearing up for launch. And boy, are they going to wear that gear. Um, Alright, let's see. Does New York Times have anything to offer? As weather improved, SpaceX began loading propellant into the rocket. Mm -hmm. How's the weather looking today? Oh, that doesn't look terrible. I'd still be concerned if it rained on my rocket right before takeoff. But yeah, we got six minutes. And White's still holding their fortress. Yeah, the next opportunity to launch... Sunday is slightly better with a 60% favorable chance, but if that doesn't work, then they'll try again on Tuesday. Lifting off in bad weather can be catastrophic to rockets. Um, so, yeah, they, there are predetermined launch criteria, and uh, SpaceX's director will call off the launch if the pre uh, predetermined launch criteria are not satisfied. I'm still concerned. Like, I don't know that I could make it as an astronaut. We'd, we'd have to see. Um, all right, White's... Oh. Speaking of clever tactics, this is hard to hold. Black is threatening um, to undermine the base of the pawn chain. And in so doing, uh, let their king access... Or king or rook access to the other pawn. Yeah, and unless white plays g4, um, black has a solid pawn chain here. So the question is, is there some opportunity for white to play g4 uh, before black just runs away with this? Or is white could successfully do a rook on the a-file defense? The a-file defense, I'm not optimistic about but it might work yeah this is nuts this is where the excitement is in rook end games huh all right well, that settles that. Black pushed and perhaps too early. Maybe there was some other way for the king to make progress. I don't know. But, um, yeah, draw is agreed. Uh, let's go watch wizard. We're off to see the wizard. Yeah, I think white does have checking distance if they play everything accurately shift everything one file over um, and suddenly that's in question so yeah taking the a file there was important
All right, we got another Nimzo. In no, Bogo Indian. No, Queens Indian. What am I talking about? Well, I see they're testing out the engines. Or there's some other explanation for the gas that's spreading. I can't say I've seen Jumbo Land's name here before, so it's exciting to see some new names and faces. Huh. Okay. I didn't expect that. We're going to get ourselves another endgame, because queens are off the board. Uh... White has traded bishops, and so now they only have three pieces to support the center. If black can manage to trade another set of minor pieces, white's center will be weak. Otherwise, white's center is very well placed. Although their king might not be. So I think you'll forgive me if for the next two plus minutes um, I mute my mic as we all watch the thing happen together. Or not happen, we'll see. But I'll mute my mic so I can listen in on the other thing.
Okay, so, uh, yeah, mission accomplished. Uh, well done to uh, NASA and the SpaceX team for a successful Stage 1 launch. Um, and I'll leave it to you to go enjoy the Stage 2 and the fuel tank recovery and all that. Um, so... Yeah, I guess um, I'm trying to think of additional positive things to say about this. Um, it's been a while since we've launched a rocket, so it's always exciting to see that happen. It was possible to see from the video feed that uh, the camera targeting the rocket, like from the ground, still had a bit of rain on its lens cap. So I think in all the excitement that was going on, um, that very minor detail was uh, forgotten about. Um, I think they were mostly concerned about the condition of the rocket, not about uh, optically what it would look like although the image looked just fine it, it was just funny to see that um, stage one separation was successful and the stage one um, I guess there aren't very many opportunities to make a decision during stage one either it works or it doesn't um, but maybe late in stage one, there are opportunities to try to uh, abort mission and eject and recover. I don't know everything about rockets, but yeah, during that very early phase, if things don't go exactly as planned, um, that may be their opportunity to decide what are we going to do during mission uh, during phase two and gather as much information as quickly as possible. Um, even though I think, like, if you consider previous, okay, white has lost on time. Sorry, I didn't think that would happen. I really didn't think that would happen. Um, but yeah, if you consider previous, uh, like Apollo 13, it isn't necessary to make the call to like land immediately. It might be riskier to try to do a turnaround than to orbit the moon and come back, um, even with a damaged craft. But it looks like everything went well. So yeah, phase one is where a lot of the excitement and risk is, I think. If something goes wrong during one of the early phases, um, you won't notice it during phase two. Or if you do notice it during phase two, there wasn't anything you could do about it anyway. What are the corresponding squares here? Um, yeah, no, I think this is just lost. I think once you're down the pawn and black has that extra rank, like that pawn is up on G4, not G5, I think that there's not a way to save this against a perfect attack. Um, I don't think there is a concept of a fortress there. I think it's just straight up lost because like here if the pawn were up a rank and black's pawn were back a rank that might be drawish but this just isn't it's 
So I don't think there's a concept of corresponding squares there. So, wow, what a strong event. Holy moly. We are seven rounds into it. And the way I know that, other than seeing all the green numbers here and the red number there, is I can see there's one red number and a score of six. And so that makes a total of seven. So yeah, we've finished seven rounds. And two players are running away with it at the moment. Oh, actually, I wonder, um, based on whether whether these players have played before in the event or not, we might see them immediately get paired. Um, there are other formats of Swisses, like an accelerated Swiss, where you don't always pair people based on their score. But no, here it is. And this might be the whatever the first prize is, dollar amount, game. All right, so we got a Slav. Then again, with the Swiss, the, the part of the excitement is that um, if both of the top players manage to draw or both of them manage to lose some games, anybody could win this. So that's part of the beauty of it. It's like you don't have one person who clearly runs away with the event unless you have somebody like Fisher playing. Um, so we see an exchange here, right? I know Black wants to win, but um, that exchange I think is called for by the book. So I think White has played this slightly better than Black. Not just on account of titles and ratings and such, but um, if Black retreats, um, I think he's making a slight concession in doing so that otherwise would not be necessary. Yep, so g3, bishop f4. So Black is forced to retreat twice and thus lose a single tempo. g3 isn't necessarily something White wants to do. Um, it might be useful, but sometimes white wants to play e3 instead. With the pawn on g3, uh, white's bishop can't use that square anymore. White's bishop also can't get to h4 because it'll be trapping itself. So unless white manages to like break in the center somehow, which we might be looking at right now. So knight takes f7 is a threat. Black's considering their options. There's more than one way to defend against the threat. Knight d5 was the move I wanted to recommend, but also I'd look like an idiot if I said it and they picked something else. So, yeah, no, knight d5 looks good to me. But also, if this looked good to white, like if um, white thought that this move worked, white would have attacked some other way. White's got something in mind, and I don't know what it is. Okay, with the knight still on d7, uh, white can play... Well, yeah, h3 is amply defended. Black commits to encasing their bishop on the edge of the board. That's a bold strategy. Right, so f7's still hanging. Um... We might be witnessing a blowout. Because knight takes f4, uh, knight d6 check, either wins a queen or mates black. Uh, right, so we have to keep the knight on this diagonal, because otherwise there's this followed by that. So... Um, White might sack on f7. There it is. Uh, I didn't see a follow-up, but I hope that white's got one. 
G4 looked kind of interesting, but not really. Uh, I didn't think this looked that interesting, but maybe there's something here. Black's bishop is still trapped on h5, and white does get to play with this with tempo. Um, but e6 might be okay. I mean, you kind of have to give... Wait, no. Uh, Black's not up a piece now. He can't sack the rook for nothing. I thought that was an exchange sack. No, e6 just gives up a rook. Um, That's kind of a problem. Yeah, that's kind of a problem. Yeah, I don't know what happened this game. Like, The sack on f7 was sound. Or I'm missing something. Queen e6 is an idea, but you get your bishop trapped. <sighs> okay. Yeah, queen f5, counterattack. You take my rook, I take your rook. I guess that's how it goes here. Um, white tries to castle... Black tries to manually castle. And uh, Black is sacking a bishop involuntarily. go. White has converted. So they're up a bishop for a pawn. Um, I say they've converted because this should not be that hard for a grandmaster at this point. Black really needs to get their kingside rolling in a hurry or this is just instantly over. But also, moving the king side might not be good enough, so. Alternatively, if black can trade off all of the pawns, they might have some miracle chance of drawing this. Um, rook d8. Okay, I guess that's a reasonable use of a tempo. Just solidify things a little bit. Give your opponent something to think about. Yeah, finally rook d8 lands. And this is the key idea. There it is. Yep, and that's the game. Let's see what this game's like. Night King 96. I have seen this name on the leaderboards before. Against uh, Grandmaster Alchemic, who resigns. And yeah, this is too strong. Wow. Um, that's brutal. I don't even see the mate here. Like, it looks terrifying. And, oh, I'm sorry, he's down a knight. That explains it. All right. So you have Wizard 98 and Calevra. Uh, Calevra, I believe, won our last Leash Us titled event. Seems to be winning this game. And the timeout. Either they had some internet issue or just 
lost the will to play on here. Um, probably the latter, because it's mate in one, right? No mate in two or something. I don't know. Rook d8 in any event looks crushing when it follows, so. Uh, okay. Uh, two international masters, Rohit and Terry. You don't want to insult Terry. If you've ever played the Oregon Trail, if you insult Terry, you die of dysentery. Uh, yeah, and no, it looks like uh, he's won the game here. Uh, being up a night and all, that makes sense. We missed the earlier part of the... Oh, this looks tricky. Okay. White is almost self-mating, but not quite. Black relieves the self-made opportunity. And white attempts to forge some path forward. Queen endgames are hard. Okay, the B-pawn's hanging, but might not be relevant. Okay, yep, that's forced, because otherwise there's queen checks. But even this queen check is pretty scary. Oh, there's the move. I missed that. And now white collects the pawns. Or just goes ahead and promotes <laughs> or mates with the pawns. Well played, Ogrela. Ogrela? All right. Don't tell me I'm going to put that on the big board. With an increment on the clock, there shouldn't be a challenge there. Ah, uh, the classic ladder mate. Alright, where's the other game? Okay, the other game also concluded. So Jumbo Land is in first with a score of 7. And we got 3 tied for second right now. Now there are tie breaks, and we can see what the tie breaks are right now. But those could change, depending on who plays who in future rounds. Um, so yeah. Three rounds to go. Place your bets. Yeah. That king and two pawns. Um, I should have known. Like, there's no way to hold that. But the way that was played was particularly convincing. As long as you don't push the H pawn first. If you push uh, the Rook pawn first, it gets harder. Because then there's a square that the opponent's king can occupy. Ah, Geary's making his way back up. Very good. That will make for an exciting finish, assuming he wins all three of his games. He can do it. Alright, so here we've got some kind of reverse Dutch. Um, or King's Indian or something. It looks like black is trying to pick a fight. Um, and white's bishop e2 is a little eccentric. Black is kind of spellbound, I guess. I don't know. Or they have a connection issue. Or they're calculating something really deeply there. But... Um, There are some interesting endgames to look at. Alright, so black has no knight on f8, no knight on f6. Theoretically, this means that white might be able to bring their knight through c3 to attack black's king. 
but there's a pawn on c3 and there's a pawn on e4 so for white to get his knight to a useful square so he can start attacking black's king will take a lot of moves uh, white commits to kingside castling but doesn't really commit to what else he's doing with all his pieces he's built this cute little wall here um, sorry like this uh, it's got this nice visual impression um, so by that logic, clearly white's intending to play g5 and h5, right? That's how it works. check on something quick here. Yep, zero dropped frames. Okay. So I think what this means is that uh, we have so many titled players featured on uh, the lobby page um, that they're all watching, or the audience is watching other streams. I know Zug's doing his thing and that's pretty awesome too. Um, I'm just surprised that here I am commentating uh, the best tournament that we've had in a couple weeks here. Um, and somehow uh, people are watching other things. Right, so we're probably going to see King h8 at some point, and Rook g8, and Black trying to attack on the king side. Yeah, no, definitely we're staying here. I see the viewer count, and I am going to tough it out anyway. <laughs> like, you know, I was telling other devs, um, like, if we don't have an official commentator for this, I'll do it. Uh, I'm not the most qualified at this, but I can give it my best. All right, black pushes on the king or ah, on the right side of the board, which is the queen side. Um, I keep thinking that's the king side here, just because like it's so much safer for black's king if it were on that side of the board than where it is right now. So I kind of like imagine that black is playing as white here, and black has his king all the way over there already, and he doesn't. Yeah, this is curious. Um, I might have happened upon this event. Uh, I didn't realize like it was so difficult to discover. So black's debating where to move their bishop or to leave it where it's at. Um, if the bishop's left on c8, then activating the rook some other way, like a7 to d7 or something, could be tricky. Um, I mentioned the seventh rank there because black has so many pawns on the sixth rank already. Um, in like other openings. In the King's Indian, for example, you could consider rook a6 to g6, but it's not happening here. Alright, so black is playing a little bit passively. He's uh, gradually finding a way to activate his pieces. He does have a slight space advantage on the queen side, and has more or less ceded the center to white. White's development is slightly behind. And black will try to dynamically take advantage of that somehow. Um, 
That's interesting. All right, so black wants to trade because um, each trade makes white's extended center feel a little bit more like it's overextended. Um, looks like black is seeking to trade all the rooks. So they're considering either rook d8 or knight c6 here. Didn't think knight g6 would happen because this knight doesn't have another square to go to next. Oh, but um, yeah, if you can get an e5, now either white elects not to give you that square or um, and the way they'd have to do that is by trading a bishop for the knight. Or you do get that, and it is considered an outpost. Although, uh, yeah, white can still offer this exchange, and your bishop is still blocked by the e-pawn. I mean, g6 is happening, right? No. Pawn g6 is not happening. It looked scary, but I thought it was okay. And it might have been okay, but definitely scary. Um, not just that turn, but like future turns, you have to be concerned about attacking possibilities. So black's playing it safe. White blasts the position open. We have a sacrifice. It looks like the sacrifice might have been an error. Is bishop e8 going to happen? No repetition. Okay. Wow, these tactics are sharp. All right, white's picked off a pawn. And there's no immediate perpetual. But um, chances are one player or the other will end up giving a perpetual check here. Unless we find a way to exchange queens and not lose material. But white's king's on dark square, black's king's on a light square. If you look at where the pawns are at, it's kind of hard to orchestrate a fork. Yeah, we put the king on the back rank where it's easier for us to check. And again, we take the diagonal. Surprisingly, uh, we're not going to see a perpetual today. Looks like uh, Jumbo Land's got a difficult task ahead of them. Because, yeah. You can just push the pawn to c6 and then work out the rest. Or you could exchange here, and that does not win. Um, but you could see if that wins or not. It was a chance, but it does not win, so white doesn't play it. Um, so yeah, it's going to take something creative to pull this off. I don't know about that. I don't know about king e8. <laughs> really? We're not doing queen f2. Queen f2... Okay. I'm sorry. I missed this. Yeah. So this has some finite evaluation. Um, given that... Uh, Given that black played into it, it's probably okay for black. But, um, yeah, if this endgame were known to be lost, uh, black would not have selected it. Uh, <laughs> uh, what just happened? Okay, no. Um, so king h7 is the decisive move. So at what point did that change here?
I guess that was it. That's brutal. You have to know your endgames. Like, there are stalemate possibilities with your king in the corner and the pawn on g7. Okay. <laughs> we get to witness this thing. How many of you have studied this one? Okay. Well, I see our masters didn't play that out any more than they did. How many of you studied this one? I'm joking. Like, this one we know the evaluation of. It looks like they're going to go all the way with it, though. Oh, g6 might have drawn. That's interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. Some multiple mistakes. Wow. It's hard to defend in time pressure. And that's one why I talk about you either know an endgame or you don't. Like, knowing it is very hard. But it is possible to know an endgame. Because it, there's a finite number of positions that can happen. All right. So, uh, there is Giri. He's made it up to, or Giri. Yeah, he's made it into eighth place here with a score of six and a half, just one point behind the lead. Um, he's got two games to make up the one point deficit. That might be hard. Even if he makes up half a point each round, he'd be just equal. So, I don't think he's taking the event today. So, um, yeah, we've watched Night King before. Actually, it doesn't matter who of these we pick. Uh, we're going to watch the players with seven and a half points get paired against each other, unless they've played before. So, I can see on my side, I don't know if you can see this, but the players have played about 200 games before uh, with Baba Ramdev having taken 94 and a half points and Night King a 96 having taken 84 and a half points so yeah um, that combined with the fact that Baba's got the white pieces does not bode well for uh, the player in first place in this event. So, I don't know if we're going to see a queen exchange like we've seen several other games. Um, if black moves the knight on d7, a queen trade's certainly possible. And with queens off the board, it's a little challenging to see how black follows up here. And I say that because the bishop on e7 uh wouldn't sit well on f6 and it wouldn't sit well on c5 either okay uh, i missed this possibility because it usually doesn't happen um but yeah no that might be a free pawn they say there's no such thing as a free lunch but wait wait so we might see knight takes bishop takes uh, rook takes. No. We might see white have some tactic somewhere where they sack the rook for two pieces. I don't see it right now. But we might see something like that. If there's a way to overload the queen on d8.
So white debates, do they just suck it up and play knight f3 or knight f5? Or do they uh, do some trades here? Because, like, exchanging on c3 doesn't look too appetizing either. But giving away the kingside knight kind of dashes their chances on an attack. So they'll take a crippled pawn structure here. Um, I guess they take the bishop pair too. Is there something other than knight takes knight to consider here? Like knight takes f2 or something? I know I was just watching a video by um, Grandmaster Hamilton about the Jerome Gambit. So I definitely have knight takes f2 on the mind. Um, I had to slip that in there. Ah, Kasparov said getting a knight to f5 is worth a pawn. I guess that makes sense. I guess there's bishop b4. It's kind of weird. I don't think it's that great, but it's something to think about. Okay. Uh, yeah? So white chooses either between takes or takes or takes or doing something else. I kind of like the option of doing something else here with bishop g5, except I miss that that just hangs a bishop. Maybe bishop e3. Oh, I see. Queen e6 loses the queen. So black is in something of a bind here. It's not the worst bind ever. Alright, black holds the pawn. Um... White intensifies pressure on a6, threatening bishop b5, which would undermine the e-pawn. But also the c-pawn is kind of loose on c2. Perhaps we exchange the bishop on g5 for a knight. But I don't see a way to continue an attack after that. Alright, we liquidate. And I guess at some point we shake hands here, right? Despite the whole time thing, um, there's like the pawns are symmetrical. Black is up one pawn, but um, it's difficult to imagine a one pawn edge being easy to convert here, even with a time advantage. So, you got the extra pawn versus the bishop pair. But if white can trade off all the queenside pawns, this should be drawn. Meanwhile, white can also consider maybe they try to get a passed pawn of their own, which would work well with their bishop pair. Uh, 
Okay, black tries to advance their past pawn, but that's just going to hem in their bishop. Okay. That a7 advance is exciting. There we go, we've trapped a rook. Black just gives it. So, yeah, it's a question of if whether black can coordinate his pieces better than white can. And rooks belong in open files, and last time, well, I was going to say last time I checked the C file's not open, but black just uh, let it go. And now black has to defend this. And he's not going to trade a rook. Um, he would rather uh, have pieces that move uniquely as opposed to white's rooks, which are going to trip over each other. King g2? Oh, never mind. We're going to take the much slower approach to attacking here. King g2 is eventually happening, no? I know rook c2 is always a possibility, but um, yeah, king g2 should happen. h3 is fine. We build up an ideal position for all of our pieces, and then we strike on f7. So we're still building up our attack. Uh, yeah, we noted that rook e7, knight g8 would just lose a tempo for white. Well, no, that would drop the e-pawn. Um, black continues trying to keep this fortress al Oh. Did not expect that. I guess that stops h4. But I don't know that h4 would have been good anyway. Yeah, I think black is holding somehow. And now I'm not so sure. Like, the knight can make it to f4. There's a lot going on here. White covers the third rank. Because otherwise black's rook might... Oh! We are trading rooks. And now I don't know this endgame. Um, White has to decide whether or not to... Uh, <clears throat> whether or not to sacrifice the h-pawn. I'm sorry, White has to decide that. Looks like white's just going to play it safe, which is probably the right decision. Yeah, well played. Good game. All right, we got this thing going on. That's a fork. That's the game. Do we have any more games? OK, we got this one. We got Ninja in black uh, oh no well hopefully he holds the draw here that'd be embarrassing to mess this up all right there we go Draw saved. <laughs> yeah, obviously he tried his chances and just wasn't didn't have enough uh, to be able to win that game. He'd overpressed and um, White didn't mess up. All right, so um, I will make an attempt to pronounce that name as we go look at our final game. <sighs> wow, what an event.
looks like um, let's see any of these top five could get tied for first at the end well no actually it'd be one of these top two is gonna take this uh, let's go watch this game Rauna Kashwani uh, 2005 versus Night King I didn't pronounce that right. Raunu Rauna Ksadwani. Something like that. It's probably also bad. That's an unfamiliar name to me. Um anyway, sorry, I got distracted. Um white and black have exchanged bishops here. Neither player has the bishop pair. The pawn structure is symmetrical. Black needs a win to win the event. So, good luck. <laughs> but he might be able to win it. We'll see. Bishop h6 is kind of exciting. I'm not sure what the bishop's doing there. If there were some kind of pawn break and white's pieces were able to rush in and threaten things, h6 might be a good square for a bishop. Um, as it stands now, I don't see the pawn break yet. So black's got time to activate their pieces. Although it looks like black might be just looking to trade the rooks and obtain whatever endgame happens. And I'm guessing black would prefer to trade all the major pieces and just play the minor piece endgame here. Because um, their bishop's kind of nice. things are happening that I did not predict. I would not have expected a5. I would not expect white to exchange rooks. I guess now that a5 is on the board, a4 makes some sense, but uh, if this was black's big plan, it's a little bit slow. And if black wants to win, that plan has to involve like promoting somehow, right? or threatening to promote, so like keeping the option of playing a3 and then trying to promote that, keeping that dream alive. You don't want to make the decision right away, but you, I don't think you want to trade on b3 um, if you're trying to win as black here. See, I had expected black to build up something more gradual with c6 and b5 or d5 and something like that, um, and expected them to come under some sort of kingside attack. Uh, instead, black is the one attacking, but uh, for how long? What's coming next? And do we follow with c5 or something? Is that the idea? We don't want to hang our pieces, so this does defend the pieces and tries to open the diagonal. And opening the diagonal might be totally fine for both players. It looks advantageous uh, to black if white opens it. But also white can maybe get their bishop onto that diagonal and start using it. It's not easy. Okay, yeah, the c pawn is defending the knight, 
So the c pawn can't take, and if the bishop takes on d4, you take the bishop and then you take the knight, or vice versa. Um, but the e4 knight might get pinned at some point too. This is kind of risky with white's king still on e1. So depending on the price structure, might uh, white may be totally fine with the draw. There might be other players who could tie white if they take a draw here. All right, so uh, white keeps the d-pawn on the board, and I guess this announces their intent to try to make use of their extra space to win this. Uh, especially if they can get the bishops traded. Um, the knight on b6 is slightly awkward. Like, this pawn dominates uh, this knight here. So black needs to use tactical means to work through that. So the notion here is that the knight on e4 can get pinned. So earlier instead of d5 I expected king f1, but um, I'm not the one playing the game, so who am I to judge? So materials getting returned, unless there's some amazing tactic that I'm missing. Uh, the knight on b6 is kind of loose. The knight on e6 is kind of nice. So it looks like the sacrifice um, might or might not have been in black's interest. He's considering bishop b4 to hold the pawn. There's an obvious risk there. Yeah, it's just not worth saving the pawn. So instead, we try to find an attack, get uh, compensation for our pawn that we just gambited. Well, that's unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, I don't think black expected this. But if white's king makes it to like e7 um, in one piece, well, okay, I guess white's king's not going that far. Black does have some self-restraint and doesn't check white every move. Um, okay. We're trying to surround the king. King's making a dash back to h2. And we have a draw agreed. I assume white offered and black accepted, but I don't know. All right, let's see if anybody else can tie. I don't think so. All right, white resigned. So Grandmaster Liam has resigned this game. And I think that solidifies our top few standings, although tie breaks can change. Um, so these are live tie break numbers, depending on how other results go that could change the tie breaks only because the tie break numbers are so so close to begin with all right here's the timeout but white's gonna promote anyway and black can't stop it it's well played Geary so Geary takes fifth Uh, <laughs> this is a fun end game. Uh, 
Oh my goodness. I hope you've studied your end games, because this one you don't want to have to calculate. All right, so yeah, we're going to tuck the king behind the pawns and then threaten to push one or the other. Our bishop on g2 prevents us from actually moving our h-pawn, so we have to move the bishop again. Um, not sure if there was a missed opportunity somewhere in there. Okay, yeah, this is useful, but it's going to cost a rook. All right, try for stalemate. Or try for some sort of fortress. Okay, you've cut off... Oh, no, that's painful. Yeah. That is painful. What an endgame. Endgames are exciting, especially this one. I kind of wish they could just skip the opening in the middle game and we could just get this kind of stuff all day. How exciting would that be? All right, white attempts to uh, stalemate, and no. Black has none of it. Tough loss by a Volcano Explorer. All right, well done to all the players. Um, so, I, Rauna takes first, uh, Sparta takes second, Night King takes third. Very well played.